A production fee for your hometown health connection was made by Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine and its sponsors. I'm Samantha Latshaw. Welcome to your hometown health connection. This is part two of the coronavirus town hall. With me is Dr. Kenneth Snyder, Kaleida's VP of Physician Quality, Assistant Professor and Neurosurgeon, and Dr. Raul Vasquez, President and CEO of G Health Enterprises, a primary care physician and founder of Urban Family Practice. We're answering your questions surrounding the pandemic. I'm Samantha Latshaw. Welcome to your hometown Health Connection. As more Americans across the country receive the COVID-19 vaccine, there are more questions. There is growing concern on how the current vaccines on the market protect against the new strains popping up across the world. Right now, there are three circulating in the United Kingdom, in Brazil and South Africa. Experts say some are more contagious than the original virus. We know you're curious about the safety of the vaccine and its effectiveness. Here to answer all your questions surrounding the pandemic is Dr. Kenneth Snyder and Dr. Raul Vasquez. Doctors, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Dr. Vasquez, what are your thoughts on travel after receiving both doses of the vaccine? Is testing, you think, still required? Well, I think, I think we're learning more about this. I think it's going to become sort of a mandatory thing when you're going to different places. But you're still going to have to wear masks, social distance, all that stuff still applies till we get better information. Uh, you know, now it's nice. These things are kept in a database. They'll know. But, but it's going to, yeah, it's going to be something that will become sort of a part of our lives now. Uh, and and that's, that's the best answer I've got. But not just because you're vaccinated, you're going to go somewhere and forget about all the other precautions. Uh, that's not safe to, to say right now. Dr. Snyder, let's talk about the third vaccine. When will the Johnson & Johnson vaccine be available and how does it differ from the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines? So Sam, great question. I would like to follow up on what Dr. Vasquez mentioned because I think it's one of the most critical segments or uh, points that we can make to the community. When you have had COVID, you can still get it again. And the variants also make that possible. You shouldn't get as sick. You shouldn't be as sick as long, but you can get it and you can spread it. So the same principle applies if you've been vaccinated. If you've been vaccinated, even though the transmissibility may go well down because of uh, the AstraZeneca study, you can still get it again and you can still spread it again. So the vaccination has allowed us to protect ourselves but the protection of spread to others in the community is not zero. And that's why the masking and that's why the public health principles are going to be so critical. Um, to come to your question, J&J &J was supposed to finalize its phase three trials about the end of January and start to submit for EUA very, very soon. So we are excited and waiting to see that data. The data that has been shared is that over 43,000 people have been enrolled in the trial. They have a 85% um, efficacy against severe disease and an efficacy on the, U on the US part of the study of 75% against moderate, and it goes to 57% in South um, uh, African variant. Again, the take home message there is this works, it works well. Again, 100% efficacy in hospitalization and death. It's one dose and it's able to just be refrigerated. So it's very exciting data, but overall, to Dr. Vasquez's point, you get whatever vaccine you can get into your arm because every one of them that we're seeing is protecting people um, with significant benefit. Yeah, I wanna follow up a little bit on this too is, remember that all these trials were done at a different time. So when you had the Moderna yes. and Pfizer, you know, the, the better response you got was when the cases were going up. Uh, with the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, you involve Brazil, you involve South Africa. So a lot of mutants were in there. While the numbers don't look the same, they might actually resemble the same. Once you're, once you're getting more people that have exposures to these, what, B117 or P1, all these other variants that are, are going to look pretty much the same, which will be pretty Critical good. Point. Critical point, Dr. Vasquez. Very, very vital information here. Thank you guys for so much knowledge that you're spreading. The community definitely needs to understand that once you recover, 
you can still get it again. And I think uh, the community uh, thinks that they're okay, that this is covered, this is taken care of, you know, I can continue and go on about my life as usual, but that's definitely not the case. Well, you know, and just to add in on the, the black and brown populations, uh, really difficult to kind of get them, the past history of things that have happened. Uh, we're, we're breaking the, you know, we, we were able to move a lot of ambassadors to really do that, but if we don't touch that market, which is 40% of the state, that 75% spot that we want to get to, becomes very difficult. So what we're doing is really tracking the vaccinations to make sure that the zip goes, that we start to kind of map out. Because if you got 98% here and 5% here, that's not going to work uh, going forward. So the myths about the vaccine are going to be real important because that's a major problem right now, at least in our communities. And I think while I wasn't a big fan of the pop-ups in the beginning, I think they're, they've been pretty effective in terms of really touching people that are looking in the communities within those zip codes. Absolutely, that's the best way to reach the population, population, meet them where they are. Now, Dr. Vasquez, if it's not my turn yet in the current phase of the vaccine rollout plan, would a note, let's say, from my doctor saying that I'm a high-risk patient for more severe COVID symptoms, would that, need, would that help to make me eligible sooner? No, not really. I mean, we're really following the 1A, 1B, and then when 1C comes out uh, to really, you know, target this. So that would, I mean... One of the things that we've done is there's a wait list, right? And if we've got three shots and nobody's there, we're not gonna waste those shots. So if we have someone like this, it might be someone we give the shot to. Uh, we, we're sticking to the rules, but we're not gonna waste any shots if it gets down to, you know, cause you break these vials and you gotta use those shots within a certain amount of time. I'm not gonna throw stuff away if we can actually touch someone's life like this. Dr. Snyder, if you are fully vaccinated, can you still catch the virus and spread it to someone else who has not been vaccinated yet? Can you explain how that actually could even happen? You touched on that earlier, but if you can just dig a little deeper, please. Sure, and I think again, it builds off of the comments that we just made. Um, your natural immune system learns how to fight the virus um, and it generates antibodies. Antibodies are, are an army that's on the ready and that if this virus came in again, it would bind to it and prevent it from binding into your body or cells. So that's the, the principle of how our natural body works. Um, if different forms of the virus show up, we may or may not be able to block it as well, but we will block it somewhat. And so the question becomes, is there a limited or milder version of the virus that you can get? And when we think about the common cold, that's exactly what happens. I think what's more important, so again, based on our previous conversation, Yes, you can get it again. It likely will be a much milder form. Yes, you can spread it again. It likely will be a much less infectious period, but it's possible and probable, uh, especially with the different changes that the virus will go through and the amount of cases that we have. The vaccines will help tremendously. I think what we need to come back to is some of our conversations of, even if that's the case, nothing we do in our life is without risk. And once we get through the crisis of the hospitalizations and the ultra severe disease that we're seeing with this, we will need to think about an optimization equation of re-engaging to life. Hospitals don't shut down. We've been taking care of this and treating people with this from day one. And we have found ways of not spreading this amongst ourselves within the workplace. The public health measures are critical. Being smart about that and understanding the disease are critical. We need to implement those on all other aspects of our lives as we re-engage each other in society and think about the, the, the public health measures um, versus death and fear of this illness and disease. And so I'm excited to see engagement in that conversation and re-emergence from this. The vaccines will definitely get us there, but thinking this through that we'll ever absolutely be able to protect ourselves is not likely the path forward. Thank you for driving that message home. Dr. Vasquez, is it possible to test negative for COVID antibodies, but still have had symptoms of the virus? Yeah, it's, it is possible because remember, you, you're getting two types of response. Uh, we, we, we're testing for the IgG component. So if you have, if you did get exposed and you're, you made IgM, you're not often gonna see it. The titer may not be the same. Two is you may have had a T cell response without really having a big beta cell, uh, beta cell response. So yeah, it, it is possible to see that in, in the labs. And we have seen it with some individuals. Dr. Samantha, to, fo 
to follow up on that again, Dr. Vasquez brought it up as well. It's critical. If 80% of the people that get this have no symptoms or mild symptoms, people may not have any idea that they've had it and actually have a positive antibody response as well. Correct. This virus is definitely extremely unique. Now, you know, a lot of people are for a while now feeling they want to go out and socialize. They want to go out and have fun. Is it safe to socialize indoors or eat at a restaurant with others who are actually fully vaccinated without having to wear a mask or social distance? What makes this entire process so tricky is that it's so counterintuitive. We want to believe that our homes or the small groups of people that we typically would spend time with in, in what we'll call our COVID families or our social networks, how could we possibly not be safe within that environment? All it takes is one individual from that group that has not followed all public health measures or for whatever reason is able to catch the virus and might be asymptomatic. And just sitting with that person for more than 15 minutes or more and less than six feet without our masks on. So when we eat, when we most often socialize is how this virus spreads. That's where it is spreading most. And so until the numbers drop dramatically, we just need to be very thoughtful of how our COVID families are continuing to respect public health measures or are enough of our most at risk people within our families protected by vaccinations that we're willing then to think through um, opening up or, 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 or loosening some of those risks. And, and there are moments in life that people need to be allowed to make whatever decisions are critically important to them. You know, when, when someone's 85 years old, how many more experiences may they have? I hope many, but we're not sure. And so these are, these are very personal decisions that people need to make with as much education on them as we can give them. Right, arming people with education so that they can make those tough decisions. So just to drive that message home, it is still very extremely risky to sit with others unmasked, eating dinner, indoors, or at a restaurant. Absolutely. Unless it's within your COVID family and people are getting tested regularly. Um, Dr. Vasquez, what are, you, what are your thoughts? No, I agree. I agree. I think, you know, we're, we're still not out of this, you know. I know we all want to get out quickly, but, we're, you know, it's going to take a little more time. And doctors, can you clarify, what do you mean by your COVID family? So if there are small groups of people that you still continue to socialize with without, um, your public health measures in place. So I'll think of again, my, my wife, my child, my close family that I live in the same household. We obviously don't have masks on all the time, but there's an appreciation and understanding that if someone is sick, we are all going to get checked and be sure that we aren't all positive and spreading. As you have other friends or other family members where you're in those scenarios where masks are off for more than 15 minutes in close contact, there's always that potential for spread. So anyone that you're doing that with throughout your day needs to be part of a close knit understanding that at any moment, if someone gets, um, gets sick with this, it could be spreading through that contact. Thank you for clarifying that. What about double mask wearing? We're hearing, we're hearing a lot about wearing two masks. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I both think, of you? yeah, I think for, for masks themselves, because I know people, you know, they, they, this question is I get one mask a week, what do I do? Uh, the mask itself has to be sort of applied correctly. I think that's the biggest thing. Two layers are often better. You don't want to pick up a mask that you can see a light, you know, because that's going to tell you it's not really doing the things it needs to do. But, you know, again, following through on the precautions of, of, of these masks. but. Uh, they don't have to be N95s. They don't have to be surgical masks. You know, those are made for certain situations, but the two layer is something that I find would be uh, most effective for people uh, in terms of, you know, the particle sizes for this coronavirus are very small, but that, remember, these masks are more, if you have the infection, not to give it to someone else, not to, to kind of prevent you from getting it, those with the N95s, you know, Dr. Schneider at the hospital, because they have more of these particles in the air. There's other stuff that the hospital has, and they have to be more protective than the regular public. 
Here's a great, a great question from one of our viewers. Uh, a few of my friends have tested positive for COVID-19. They have no symptoms other than loss of taste and smell. When should they be retested? The problem with that is they, they, the, the new CDC guidelines for the state is we don't. You know, they're, they're going, you know, because the coronavirus can be in the system for 30 days. So you're retesting, all you're gonna do is get back a positive test. What you do look at is if they lost taste and smell, but not develop shortness of breath and cough, where you think there might be a change, that's when you might wanna do, you know, you, you'll do a PCR to kind of confirm that something else is going, not a rapid test. Uh, so that, I, that's been my experience, Dr. Snyder. I don't know what, but it's a change in symptoms that trigger us to do something. If it's those same symptoms and it's just that, you, it's gonna stay in the system for 30 days. So any test done during that time, it's really a waste of the test. Um, if someone's lost taste or smell, that is a highly sensitive and specific measure that they have COVID. And they just need to recognize that, even if that's their only symptom, to go get tested so that during the 14 day period of that symptom coming on, that they will not be as infectious after that time frame, even if they still tested positive. So it's just making sure that that individual with what we might call mild symptoms isn't spreading that virus to other people during that phase. Absolutely, it's one of the unique markers to COVID. Uh, Dr. Snyder, are antibody treatments like Regeneron being given in Western New York and how effective is this early on in the treatment? Yeah, um, really exciting data and recent data um, on this as well. And this falls um, into some of the conversation Dr. Vasquez and I have had on you know, what are our antibodies, um, what are our T cells, how does our immune system work? Um, so what the monoclonal antibody is, is that synthetically we've made an antibody that's now a medicine. It's your body's immune response to the vaccine or to the virus. So we've learned how to take a piece of how your body would naturally respond and be able to immediately give it to someone. When someone gets the virus, it takes them a period of time, sometimes a week, sometimes 10 days, sometimes more, to develop the antibodies and have them circulating in, their, in your body. So imagine you could synthetically have those and give them to somebody right away when you knew they were infectious and had the virus, especially to people that were highest risk. Those elderly groups that I mentioned, people that are obese, people that, um, that we know don't do well and are prone to severe disease. So that's exactly what we mean when we say monoclonal antibody treatment. It means we're automatically giving somebody um, a ability to fight this virus right away and try and prevent it from binding. So within Western New York, um, within you know, Dr. Nadler and Kalida Health have really helped build and lead an effort to be able to do these complex infusions uh, and so if you ha are tested positive for COVID within 10 days of development of symptoms, and you have any one of the following, your body mass index is more than 35, you have a severe kidney disease, diabetes, you're immunosuppressed, you're over 65, or you're 55 with severe comorbidities, you are eligible to get this infusion. What's exciting about this data is two things. People that have gotten this from either Eli Lilly or Regeneron, and it's, it's a different mix of what antibodies you get in each of these, but the studies are similar. There's a 70% reduction in hospitalization and zero deaths within the treatment arm. What's very exciting is new data is coming out that this drug can be given subcutaneously, not by infusion. And so we're very excited about that potential. And again, Vaccination's ideal. Your body learns to fight it and learns to fight it long term, like Dr. Vasquez pointed out. There are people that were alive from the 1918 Spanish flu that when they were reintroduced to similar influenza 90 years later, developed antibodies in 24 hours. That's how good our body is at learning and remembering how to fight these illnesses. But when those mechanisms aren't in place, the fact that we can administer that to somebody as a treatment is exceptional. You know, and I want to follow up. So uh, on Dr. Schneider's, the monoclonals, I'm 100% in agreement. I'm not, I'm not so much in agreement with the convalescent plasma because what we find there is, I know it's happening and, and, and it's something that we use, but it's a low amount of antibodies. And what I fear is that we're going to create viral mutations 
or resistant, just like with antibiotics. But the monoclonal, I think, are dead on. I mean, they'll, they'll work really well. So I know we're doing some things sometimes, but I don't know. That's been my experience, Dr. Schneider. I don't know what you've seen. Agreed, and the data bears out that, that intuition exactly. Um, and again, hopefully we'll be able to continue to offer it in the community um, uh, as the opportunity continues to build around it. But I think the important point is what we've learned in a year about this virus is tremendous. And more importantly, what we've learned is how the virus works in different phases and putting appropriate treatments in the appropriate phase of the illness. Um, and so that's really been critical. Very important information. Uh, what other treatments do you recommend for those that are perhaps in the hospital or sick at home? What are your thoughts on remdesivir or, or anything else? Sure. So um, each of these um, treatment options um, have great benefit when they're given to the right person at the right time. And so prior to ever getting infected, you want to be thinking about boosting up your natural immune system, sleep, hydrate, vitamin D, vitamin C, um, zinc. This is when vaccination is critical. Okay. When you know you've been exposed, if you're a high risk person, this is when the monoclonal antibody cocktails play a significant part. Right now, the remdesivir, the antivirals are only for people that are hospitalized. And when you get hospitalized, we have teams of physicians that are knowledgeable on the guidelines of treatment of care and what needs to happen during each of the different phases. Steroids have made a dramatic impact mm -hmm. in care. Aspirin and blood thinners have made a dramatic impact in care. And so we continue to refine and learn a great deal. If you're home with this illness, what we've noticed is critical is having a pulse ox at home. The ability to know your oxygenation level because we think of people having low oxygen being tired or fatigued or struggling for air. That's not how this virus works. You could feel fine and be walking the stairs, but your pulse oximeter is into the high 80s, which is too low and anybody below 93 needs to be potentially hospitalized. So contacting your physician with any symptom, monitoring your home oxygen levels, probably the most important thing of information we could share with the public. And just to piggyback on, um, um, when we see patients, a little bit different in the sense that we actually do a lot of inflammatory markers. Because you know we, this condition not only created cytokine storms in the lungs, but it caused a lot of inflammation elsewhere. So people that had had a little bit of heart disease, this makes it worse. A lot of organs that often act up. And, and Dr. Snyder alluded to the post-COVID syndrome that people are gonna have after we get out of this. So there's some damage that is there and will not get better. And that's why this vaccine can prevent you from going that route. Here's another great question from one of our viewers. What are, if any, CDC or NIH recommendations for masking in the workplace? I ask because my employer only issues one mask per, per employee per week. Dr. Vasquez? No, I think, I think you know, one mask is okay. It's just, it's gotta fit well. It's gotta be two layer. Uh, and you wanna be able to not see through it. You know, those are the things that are pretty much uh, what you wanna do. If it's dirty, uh, if it's reusable, just, just wash it. Don't just, I see people wear the same mask for six, you know, even though you get one a week, you wear it for like two months. You know, change this thing around. You don't need the N95s. You don't need the surgical. That's more hospital grade. I think, again, this mask is there. If you have it, you're not going to give it to someone else. It's not going to be something where it's going to be 100% protective uh, in any place. And if you're following the social distancing, uh, that should be enough. You're not going to be around anyone for, for more than 15 minutes when you break that six feet cycle, and that's when your concern should be. But um, I don't, I don't know, Dr. Snyder, I think that's, that's what I would recommend. Yeah, you, I agree completely. There's been so much um, discussion on this lately from a very well-written medical commentary in Cell Press um, from a few weeks ago, January 15th. It was by Dr. Monica Gandhi from UCSF Infectious Disease and Dr. Uh, Linda Marr, who's an engineer, environmental engineer at Virginia Tech. And they spoke about all the literature to date on masking. And to Dr. Vasquez's point, the first thing is it works. It works to limit the spread. It's what keeps us safe in the hospitals. The next point that Dr. Vasquez pointed up is if you don't wear it right, it doesn't work. Where there's all of this discrepancy is what works better than others and how much do we need both to protect ourselves and protect others. 
And um, the science behind that is difficult and it's difficult to interpret. You, they basically take two mannequins, put them one foot away from each other, put the virus in one mannequin's mouth and spray it through masks to the other and they see how much got through. So how useful that is to day-to-day -day life is a conversation. What we learn from those types of studies is that to Dr. Vasquez's point, multiple layers work better than others. Surgical masks work great. The questions just become, how much do we really need to slow the spread of this? And the answer to that, because we live it every day in the hospital, is wear a mask and wear it well. And the non-single layer acrylics, things that you can see through, which are basically like wearing nothing, really don't help you. So it's that level of understanding and that reference to that paper delves into it nicely for people that have concerns. Would perhaps taking into a personal account, okay, I wore this mask for about an hour. I was in close contact with a few people at 15 minutes or so or, or an hour. That would then determine, okay, maybe I should start a new mask. It's a great question. And I don't know that we've got the science down on it perfect. I know that as virus gets trapped, it affects its ability to filtrate. The complexity of this conversation is difficult because the surgical masks and the N95s actually have an electrostatic charge, which helps bind virus as well. I would say cycling through, um, the CDC tells us how to make masks at home that are highly effective using vacuum cleaner bags, coffee filter bags. So having to use and need the same one every single day may not make sense, uh, but looking at how I could cycle through them and clean them to Dr. Vasquez's point or purchased some higher level effective masks. I think those will be critical as we think about implementing the public health measures to get back into the workspace and work around one another. This will be a critical element of getting it correct. Dr. Kenneth Snyder and Dr. Raul Vasquez, thank you so much for joining us. Dr. B, thanks again, it's great to see you. Thank you, Dr. Snyder. Bye, Dr. Snyder. Bye, Sam. Bye, Annette. Have a great day, everybody. The two COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective and have been vetted through clinical trials that included thousands of people. Potential side effects of the vaccine are mild, such as a headache, fever, or swelling of the injection site. According to the CDC, in very rare cases, allergic reactions may occur, but vaccination providers have medicine on hand to treat such reactions. Health experts say the consequences will be dire if not enough people get the vaccine, as it's society's best chance of recovering from the pandemic. If your loved one is hesitant to get the COVID-19 vaccine, please share today's show. I'm Samantha Latshaw. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and be well. A production fee for the preceding presentation of Your Hometown Health Connection was made by Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine and its sponsors.